Welcome back to today's press review from Levant TV. We will be talking about the ongoing crisis in Syria and the chances of any Iranian participation in Geneva too, where we will be joined later by Professor Anoush Ehtishami of the School of Government and International Affairs at the University of Durham. But before our Mideast analysis, let's start as usual with papers here in the UK. The Guardian leads its front page reporting that George Osborne is facing a battle with the Work and Pensions Secretary Ian Duncan Smith over his plan to impose an extra £12 billion turning in welfare cuts after the next general election. The paper also pays tribute to its famous journalist Simon Hoggart, who passed away aged 67. The Independent leads its front page reporting on George Osborne being accused of targeting the poor and vulnerable and sparing the rich as he outlined £25 billion of new spending cuts, with half of them coming from the welfare budget. The paper also features pictures of enormous waves breaking Porthcoal Harbour in South Wales, as the paper asks, is this the right time to be cutting the flood budget? And the Daily Telegraph leads its front page reporting on new government plans to reduce top speeds on selected roads in a bid to meet EU rules on air pollution levels near schools and homes. The paper also reports on Osborne's welfare cuts and on a surge in support for tough curbs on migrants. And now let's take a look at the top stories in the Middle East. While Iran is a key regional player so far, it is not on the list of the participants in the Geneva II conference on Syria. We will also look at the Western business investments defying sanctions on the country. France, Iran and uh, Front of Mistrust, uh, an opinion piece from John Vineker of the Wall Street Journal, analyzes French-Iranian relations in the light of US shifts in Iran policy. Vineker says, in the midst of the West's Christmas to New Year's news, Iran's ayatollahs demonstrated their share of big-time cunning. The result? Remarks that look like an offer to the US of one-on-one -on -one talks on Tehran's nuclear program, which would maximize its chances of getting a concessional-laden uh, deal from the Obama administration. The offer, even though that's not how Iran described it, was made in a statement on December the 27th by former Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Vilayeti, who is often referred to as the closest advisor on external affairs to Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the Iranian supreme leader. It appears to the White House's desire to resuscitate Barack Obama's presidency with a slam-bam peace in my time accord may satisfy many previously resistant congressmen with the sense they will have a greater hand in the final negotiations and block an increasingly assertive uh, naysayer's role for France among the UN Security Council's Iran negotiators. All this while the Ayatollahs generally, uh, generously save face for the other five countries, Britain, China, Russia, France and Germany, by offering them separate one-on-one -on -one talks, tracks and presumably tailor-made trade opportunities. Artful, no? The writer observes that according to an Associated Press Dispatch uh, headlined Iranian official calls for direct talks with Washington, Mr. Vilayeti said of the current Iran uh, Security Council discussions, we aren't on the right path if we don't have one-on-one -on -one talks with the six countries, we have to have talks with the countries. According to Vineker, the exceptionally clever aspect of the maneuver is that it can gain a degree of theoretical traction in Washington and something very close to support in capitals like London and Berlin, where the dominant idea is to get the Iran thing done. Which means Barack Obama, having already given ground on Iranian uranium enrichment and remaining inexplicit about uh, more concessions, would be effectively left with the West's share of decisions about the young century's most important international security problem. Camille Grand, director of the Paris-based Foundation for Strategic Research, gave Iranian cleverness its due over the weekend, saying the fact is three quarters of the world would applaud America's taking over the show. He adds, over the past few months, a number of former French uh, diplomats backed by commercial interests have been arguing to this effect the Americans will eventually go to the one-on-one -on -one talks and will be isolated because Obama wants a deal in the, and the Iranians are smart enough to give him one. An article in the Deutsche Welle uh, titled uh, Iran wants a seat at CM peace talks looks at reasons for Iran to take part in the forthcoming Geneva II conference on Syria. 
The paper looks at Iran as a central player in the war between C and President Bashar al-Assad and the rebels. Gunter Mir, head of research uh, uh, on the Arab world at the Mainz University in Germany, told the paper that Tehran had a key role in the war in Syria. Among the reasons for the strategic partnership between Iran and Syria is a 2006 mutual military support agreement the country signed. In that light, Iran was employing all its resources to keep Assad in power. Furthermore, on whether Iran is part of the problem in Syria and has significant influence on the government in Damascus, Volker Perthes, Middle East expert and director of the German Institute of International and Security Affairs, told Deutsche Welle, if you don't want that uh, someone who's part of the problem to become part of the solution, you have to include him. Tehran's participation is important for the success of such a conference. That's also the way Iranian government sees the situation and Tehran has offered to mediate in the conflict, said Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif. Perthes adds, it's particularly the United States and Saudi Arabia that object to Iran joining the talks. Saudi Arabia is determined to topple Assad. The Gulf state was the largest supporter of the opposition in Syria, confirmed mayor of Mainz University. Just like for Iran, for the Saudi Kingdom, the war in Syria is about strengthening its own position in the Middle East. In that respect, it's the largest Sunni regional power, Saudi Arabia, fighting a proxy war with the largest Shiite uh, regional power, Iran. Perthes adds, Washington might show some flexibility on that point. This assumption is backed up by the fact that uh, with the new Iranian president, uh, Hassan Rouhani, the relations between the US and Iran have begun to gradually improve, while Mayer said he believes Obama would do everything in his power to achieve a peaceful solution. The article adds, United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has personally spoken in favor of Tehran, saying, Iran can play an important role, the country is an important regional power. Including Tehran was therefore logical, practical and realistic. Mayor and Perthes both see that despite that all the differences between Iran and the other countries involved, there is an increasingly uh, common interest to prevent radical Islamist groups in Syria from gaining even more strength. In that respect, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States and also Russia and Europe have a common enemy. For Iran, this fact could increase the chances to attend the Swiss conference after all. And the Jerusalem Post features a piece by uh, Benjamin uh, Wentel titled Analysis Has the Geneva Agreement Undercut Sanctions to Stop Iran's Nuclear Program? When it all finds Geneva a hard sell is no small, in no small measure because Israel and US's Arab allies in the Gulf see gaping holes in the sanctions relief provided to Tehran. A range of Middle East experts voiced uh, new warnings on Sunday in the course of interviews with the Jerusalem Post. Avarice-driven conduct by Western businesses will help Tehran develop a nuclear weapon and repress its population's human rights, according to experts. Professor Gerald Steinberg, a political scientist at Bar Ilan University, said, After Geneva, and without any significant change in Iranian behavior, the gold rush is on to resume business as usual. The claims made by President Obama and European leaders to the effect that they can simply restore sanctions whenever the Iranian leaders resume production of nuclear weapons looks like uh, increasingly hollow. He added, if the sanctions continue to unravel, the last resort for stopping Iran is a military operation that Israel, the US and Europe have long sought to avoid. Der Spiegel magazine addressed the breakdown in the anti-Iran business atmosphere, headlining its article, Chance of a Century, International Investors Flock to Tehran. Daniel Bernbeck, uh, head of the German-Iranian Chamber of Industry and Commerce in Tehran, told Der Spiegel that airplanes to Iran are full of Italians, which includes managers from the Italian energy company NESPA. Der Spiegel noted France is also on the move in a deal worth billions. The French are about to renew their licensing contract for supplying Peugeot components to Iranian car maker Iran Khodro. And Israel, in Israel, experts expressed uh, growing frustration and disappointment with the international community's failure to confront Iran. Tommy Steiner, a senior research fellow at the Institute for Policy and Strategy at the Interdisciplinary Center uh, Herzliya, told the Post the flocking of European and American executives to try and position themselves for making business with Iran in anticipation of additional sanctions relief undercuts the negotiating posture of the US and the EU in the next round of negotiations. 
Iranian negotiators might misinterpret the executive's charm offensive and wrongly assume that the soon relief of sanctions is a done deal and that they are not compelled to roll back and dismantle their nuclear program. And to conclude, Weintel states that with Iran securing as much as 20 billion US dollars in sanctions relief, the interim agreement may have erred on the side of proving Iran with a heavy dose of carrots. And joining us today is Professor Anoush Etishami, Professor Director of the Al Subah Program and Joint Director of the ESRC Center for the Advanced Study of the Arab World in the School of Government and International Affairs at Durham University. Professor Ahtishami, thank you very much for joining us today. Can you hear me? Uh, it's my pleasure indeed. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Thank you. According to the Deutsche Welle, uh, Saudi Arabia is fighting a proxy war with the largest Shiite regional power, which is Iran. And just like the US, the kingdom does not want Iran to participate in Geneva too. Uh, my first question, uh, do you think that Washington might show some flexibility on that matter in the light of the gradually improving relations with Iran? Uh, I, I think that is inevitable, and I think the U.S. is already beginning to factor in a, a, a role, albeit behind the scenes or on the sidelines of Geneva II for Iran, in terms of facilitating a process of dialogue, but more importantly, to ensure that whatever the Assad regime signs up to, it is able to deliver. Uh, I think the United States and other countries in the region recognize that Iran now has considerable influence over Syria. But what has changed since uh, Rouhani's election success, of course, is this open access to Iranian leaders by the United States and other global powers. And that is a very significant development in terms of trying to address the region's chronic and ongoing problems. Yes. And um, in regards to uh, the uh, business, I mean, uh, let's actually stay on the same uh, subject. The Jerusalem Post considers that the Iran that Iran uh, um, thinks of uh, of business deals now, and which are actually in breach of sanctions to Iran. It's a different subject here. Maybe it's it's not really related to to Geneva II and the participation. But just as we spoke about Iran, uh, do you think that these companies and these investments will really influence the U.S. policy in Iran? <coughs> I, I think Iran's economy is in a dire crisis, mm -hmm. in dire straits. They have significant structural, but also more immediate problems to address. As you know, oil output Iran has dropped significantly. Its capacity, ability to export has dropped significantly. And as a consequence, its ability to generate foreign currency has also been affected by the sanctions. Iran's ability to, to trade internationally has been adversely affected by the sanctions. Iran's ability to uh, encourage investment has been affected. And with very high inflation at home, with very high unemployment at home, frankly, it's Iran that needs the global finance and not other way around. That said, of course, Iran's economy it presents huge opportunities for Western and Asian companies. Uh, it's not just the oil sector, but that is the most obvious area in gas, in upstream investments and so on, that Iran needs, very badly needs support. And the foreign companies need access to its vast energy deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, infrastructure, um, uh, industry, manufacturing, uh, basic industries are all in need of renewal in Iran. And of course, all these companies are very much looking forward to opportunity to have access to Iran's vast opportunities there. And uh, while you think that I Iran is in dire need for, for foreign currency and investments and business because of its ailing economy, uh, so can we still say that the US and the West in general have, have a business motive behind their rapprochement with Iran? I, I think both parties have a business motive. Right. Iran knows that without diplomatic dialogue, it will not be able to lift the sanctions on the country. And in order to improve the economy, it must lift the sanctions. And the other side knows that once it enters a dialogue with Iran, and eventually when relations are restored, that Iran's economy will open up and therefore present opportunities for Western and Asian and even uh, European Russian companies. So it seems to be in both parties' interest 
to grasp the nettle and look for a solution. It will take some time, of course, before Iran's economy is anything like uh, able to absorb foreign investment from advanced companies. But to be fair, the needs are so great that, that, it, it, that both parties recognize the diplomatic dialogue is the first step towards a much, much bigger opportunity of building economic relations. Yes. And um, Iranian negotiators, uh, it's been said in the Jerusalem Post, might misinterpret the executive's charm offensive and wrongly assume that the soon relief of sanctions is a done deal and that they are not compelled to roll back and dismantle their nuclear program. Do you really agree with this? Uh, I don't. Uh, as I, I really... I believe what the diplomats have said, and they have said that this is an interim agreement uh, of, of a six-month duration. And it's in that period that a lot of the really hard work will have to take place and the hard negotiations will have to be concluded. If the parties at the table, and indeed people behind the table, Iranian parliament, the American Congress are two examples, do not approve of the process of negotiations, then they are very capable of blocking progress being made. So this is an interim arrangement. The parties themselves recognize this, but they want to make it work. That is what is different. Mm -hmm. From Israel's perspective, they see the interim arrangement as part of a deal that will yield to compromise on the, on the side of Iran and, and the United States in particular. But neither Iran nor the U.S., can dare make that, that assumption because of their own domestic politics. And also, there are other vested interests in the region. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Russia, and others are looking at this with great care to make sure that their interests are not violated by any deal that may be cut between, between Iran and the United States. So this is no more than an interim deal, but most of us hope that it will work for the sake of the region because it will help restore stability to the region in the long run. Um, and Professor Shami, back to the Geneva II conference on Syria and uh, Iran's participation in it. Uh, Gunter Mayer, head of the Center of Research on the Arab World at Mainz University, believes President Obama would do everything in his power to achieve a peaceful solution uh, throughout this conference and, of course, in the preparations with, with what entails uh, uh, with the list of participants and including uh, Iran, of course. Uh, do you agree that uh, President Obama really has this will to achieve a peaceful solution in Syria? He, I, he may not even have the will. But I think there is a necessity that right. they make this work because of moral pressure, because of political security and diplomatic pressure uh, on 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 uh, United States. Uh, I don't see much option beyond making Geneva to work as a basis. This would not provide a, an ideal or ready-made solution to the Syrian crisis but it is the only way in which we can begin to rebuild a process of dialogue and negotiations that will end this ghastly conflict in, in Syria. And regionally, the Americans are under huge pressure from Saudi Arabia, from Turkey, from Jordan, uh, and Israel and others to make sure that they can stabilize the Syrian crisis. Mm -hmm. And internationally, they're under huge pressure from their allies in NATO and the European Union and, of course, they have an eye on Russia and what Russia is trying to do in the region to make sure that Geneva II does yield something constructive uh, mm -hmm. and, and, if you like, a roadmap towards a settled solution. But that roadmap will be long and America will need the support of everybody involved. And that means Saudi Arabia, that means Lebanon, that means Jordan, that means Turkey. But it also means Iraq, it also means Iran, and it also means Russia. And that is why the Americans are trying to be as inclusive, as inclusive as they can in going into Geneva talks, because they recognize that they cannot deliver this by themselves, but also recognize that the cost of letting this war continue is far too great for the Americans, but also more importantly, for the people of Syria and the region more broadly. So this is the only game in town, and they will have to make it work. Given that they have some open channels with Iran now, given that the chemical weapons discussions have now led to some sort of a, a resolution, the doors seem to be opening for a, uh, a better relationship going into Geneva. 
And mm -hmm. I think the Americans will be hopeful that they can make mm -hmm. a deal stick here. Prof yeah, Professor Etishami, thank you very much indeed for your participation. Thank you. Indeed. That was a remarkable contribution, as usual, from Professor Anusha Etishami, also Special Advisor to the Islamic Criminal Justice Project in the Center for Criminal Law and Justice at Durham. Now let's continue with our top stories from the Middle East. With the fighting in Syria intensifying and the Geneva II peace talks nearing, let's take a look at what analysts have written in today's press. Writing for front page, uh, Ryan Mauro headlines an opinion piece titled Al-Qaeda vs. Al-Qaeda light in Syria. Mauro says, don't get too excited by the headlines of a new revolution in Syria against Al-Qaeda. The offensive is led by the Islamic Front, a Salafist coalition backed by Saudi Arabia with the explicit goal of instituting Sharia. Mauro adds, the ISIS denies reality, refusing to recognize that it is simply another group. It refuses to go to independent courts. It attacked many other groups, stole their weapons, occupied their headquarters, and arbitrarily apprehended numerous activists, journalists, and rebels. It has been torturing its prisoners. Comparing the two, Mauro says that the difference has nothing to do with the ideology. In fact, the Islamic Front spokesperson never ever mentioned Sharia or democracy. The bottom line is that Al-Qaeda is thuggish and doesn't play well with others. Mauro explains that the Islamic Front is a proxy of Saudi Arabia. It was organized by the Saudi government. It's stridently Salafist and is led by a man whose father is a Saudi cleric. The Saudis hired Pakistanis to train five to 10,000 of them, basically. The Islamist uh, Front is, is Saudi Arabia's way of consolidating control over the Syrian rebellion and turning into a more cohesive force. The Saudi objective is to have a Salafist force that, unlike Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood, is not its enemy. He concludes that the West's revolution against Al-Qaeda does not signal the ascent of moderates. All it shows is that Islamists are competing for control of and the non-Islamists are not in the picture. Dr. Mohammed Abdul Al Ibrahim writes a commentary piece for Sia Times titled The Nobel for Fighting Terrorism. Al Ibrahim says the Syrians have been living and for about three years in a crisis. Yes, this is painful and dramatic. This crisis, however, has increased and even imposed some new thoughts, ideas and discourse upon some of the Syrians. The writer adds to the disappointment of anti Syrians and Wahhabi terrorist sponsors and traffickers, the popularity of the leadership of Syria has even uh, been solidified, increased, and skyrocketed. The more the crisis drags on, the more this popularity soars. And he adds that it is expected that the Russian US proposed Geneva II would form the beginning of a political process, but not the end of the crisis imposed upon the Syrians and created by the US their petrodollars and their masters. Al Ibrahim concludes that almost all of those who were misled at the beginning of the crisis have become aware of the danger and deadly poison of the cancerous Wahhabi Takfiri hired terrorists and killers, adding that it is the duty of every individual institutions and state to combat, fight and eliminate terrorism and its sponsors. And Godfrey Bloom, an independent member of the European Parliament for Yorkshire and Humber, writes a comment piece for politics.co.uk titled We have turned our back on the Christians of Syria. Bloom reflects on Nigel Farage's uh, comments on Syrian refugees, saying that the British and others in the free world do have a responsibility for the displaced and persecuted in the world. And he adds that Christians were left in peace to worship in secular Syria, yet when a civil war started to enforce some form of theocracy, the British Foreign Office and CIA could not wait to help whichever potential government might serve the usual narrow interests of geopolitical short-term advantage. At one stage, the British government wanted to bomb Syria. And he adds that I totally conquer with Nigel Farage. We have a duty to those suffering in this cruel conflict, especially the Christians whom the West betrays globally at every turn. 
Bloom concludes that I have led the fight for a more sensible overseas aid policy over several years, one, million pound, one billion pounds sterling per month, most of it wasted or at least unaudited. Let us focus some of that money to help these tragic people and perhaps our leaders might learn that their persistent interference overseas seems to always end up in tragedy. And finally, let's take a look at the top headlines from international papers. Starting with the China Daily, which leads its front page with the headline Illegal Ivory Stash Destroyed. The International New York Times leads its front page with the headline Echoes of Snowden in 71 Theft at FBI. And the UAE's Gulf News leads its front page with the headline Whether We Will Strike US and Coastal Britain. And finally, Israel's Jerusalem Post leads its front page with the headline US framework will have elements both sides dislike, says Netanyahu. And for more updates, please visit us on levant.tv. That was all we had for today. We will be with you again tomorrow for another analytical press review.